I'm Wynton Marcellus, and this is my jazz orchestra. When the Birches of Massachusetts visiting the maestro Sage Ozawa and the Tanglewood Music Center Orchestra. We've brought these two ensembles together to hear how fundamental elements of music are shared by different musical styles. All of the music we will examine tonight is from the Nutcracker Suite, composed by Peter Ilyich Tchaikovsky. And we're fortunate to have an American version of the same piece arranged by Duke Ellington and Billy Strayhorn. We'll be using this music to study the most basic component of music, which is rhythm. Now, many of you may think that melody is the most basic because that's what we recognize, that's what we remember. The melody is the song, for example. We all recognize this melody. But what if we take the rhythm away? What happens now? You see, we can't go to the next note without creating some type of rhythm. No motion, no rhythm. No rhythm, no music. Now, let's take the melody away and see what happens. This is still music, even though there's no melody, because music is organized sound in time. Any sound, if it's organized, is music. It could be you beating your chest like. <laughs> That's right. As long as it's organized, it's music. I mean, every day we're surrounded by rhythms. You wake up in the morning and you eat some, some oatmeal or whatever you like to eat, grits with some sugar in it or some salt. You go outside, and what do you hear? You hear this. This is not music. This is not music. It's fun to play, but it's cacophony or noise. It's unorganized. But in the midst of this cacophony, sometimes you hear somebody who's really frustrated in traffic, and they might blow their horn like this. Well, now, when you hear that, it makes you feel good because it's music. Now, actually, we don't have to look outside of ourselves to find rhythm. We live with a rhythm machine inside of us. Now, who can tell me what that rhythm machine is? What is it? Heart. That's right, it's your heart. Now, we have a what? A heart beat. So we could say a rhythm indicates how alive we are. If our heartbeat stops for too long, we don't have to worry about learning about rhythm. That's it. Now, when we go to the doctor, the doctor will do this. It's feeling for our what? Pulse. That's right, our pulse. And what does our pulse sound like? Don't, 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 don't. Our pulse is a steady beat. It's like the seconds ticking on the clock. No accents and no rest. This is organized, but it could hardly be called musical. What if everything in our lives was without rest or accent? This is what a busy avenue would look like. How would cars run on that? Now, what if we spoke like, I am going to the store to buy something to eat, but do you know what happened to me last week? A terrible thing, but soon I will run out of breath. You see, music is the same way. You see, we need accents and rest to perceive the organization of this avenue. Aha. Now, we could drive on that. You see those lines? Those are the accents. And you see the stop sign? That lets us know it's time to rest. Regulates the traffic. Rhythms are the same way. You need accents and rest to perceive the organization of a rhythm. See, now you can tell something about this rhythm. And we have name for these organized units. For example, if somebody asks you how far from home to school, you're going to tell me five blocks, not 6,737 steps. 
Or you might say 10 minutes, not 600 seconds. You organize the distance or break up the time to understand it. In music, we organize the beats, accents, and rests into something called meter. And meter is counted just like numbers. There are odd and even meters. For example, odd. One, two, three. Or else, in an even meter. One, two, three, four. You see, they feel odd or even. Now let's listen to sections of Waltz of the Flowers from the Nutcracker Suite. Tchaikovsky's is in an odd meter of three, and then Duke's arrangement is in an even meter of four. To this point, we've talked about accents and rest of the same length to get you all to understand what meter is. But what do musicians like to do most with rhythms? Well, we like to do what everybody likes to do. We like to play. That's right. Now, we just happen to have a basketball on the bandstand. Don't ask me why. We like to travel with one. <laughs> now, in basketball, when we first learned how to dribble, it was an achievement just to bounce the ball in a steady motion like this. Do it like that. You know, you could spend a long time, just might take you two weeks to learn how to do that, or a month. But in order to have fun playing, we have to vary the bounces by accenting to throw an opponent off. Like, you wouldn't dribble in a game. You have to and then sometimes you rest and you pass the ball. Now, the reason we're dribbling is to go from one point to another, hopefully closer to the basket. And we want to dribble with imagination and style. 
If you're not going to have imagination and style, it doesn't make sense to play. Now, in music, we play with rhythms from tiny, fast ones to long, slow ones. It's just like dribbling that ball. And also in music, we travel through the meter by way of measures. Now, we have a nickname for measures. Measures are called bars. As musicians, we like to say that. Now, we'll have my helpers who are going to come up here with a good book, and we're going to see something. Hopefully, it'll be interesting to us. And if not, it's interesting to me. Now, these are bar lines. You see these lines? And even though musicians reading music, we're the only ones who can see these bars. All of us, listeners and everybody, we feel them, their existence. What they do is they mark beats. So if we're in a meter of four, every four beats we have a bar line. But if you look at this score, you'll notice we have all kinds of rhythms dancing up and down up in here. And these notes sound exactly like they look. Like you see, we have some little fast ones right here. These are hard to play too. We have some long ones and we have some middle ones. So that's what we do when you're writing music or when you're playing it. The motion equals the rhythm. Thank you all very much. We dance, hop, skip, fly, and tickle rhythms through the meter. And the measures are our points of reference. The measures let us know where we are. Here's some different motions that can be associated with rhythms. These examples are from the march section of the Nutcracker Suite. Well, first, since we call it a march, first motion is marching. Then we could have skipping. And then bouncing. What about flying? And what about tickling? Of course, since we have so many instruments in an orchestra, we can always combine motions like marching and flying. And now let's hear Duke Ellington's arrangement of this same march. Uh, mm, 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 uh.
that we know about marching, skipping, bouncing, flying, tickling, and everything, we want to know the speed at which we do these things. The speed of beats and rest is called the tempo, and the tempo has a powerful effect on the feeling or mood of a piece of music. I mean, walking a mile would certainly put us in a different mood than running one would. <laughs> Let's listen to the excitement generated by a rapid tempo in the Russian dance. Did you notice, did you all notice that the tempo speeds up even more at the end? Did you notice that? Pick up in tempo. Now this is called an accelerando. It's just like the gas pedal that makes a car go faster. It's called an accelerator. Now in most scores, there are some Italian words that describe the tempo, things like largo, which means slow, and vivace, which means lively, but I just say very fast, and allegro, which means moderately fast. Let's hear some of the same piece at a slower tempo. Now you see, that sounds like an entirely different piece of music, doesn't it? Does it sound like entirely? Yeah. Now we're gonna mix up fast and slow so we can give you a better example of the type of effect tempo has on the mood of a piece of music. Well, we were talking about notes dancing or stepping and you dancing and all of that. Actually, the Nutcracker is a ballet. It was written for people to dance to. Many times we may hear someone say that a beat is danceable or most likely they'll say, I like that beat. Well, what beat are they talking about? It can't be all of those rhythms dancing and skipping through the meter because that's not one beat, it's many, many, many beats. That beat is what we call the ground rhythm. These are the blue collar workers of music, overworked and underpaid. It's just like grass, we walk on it all day. Here's an example. Now that gets pretty boring after a while. Actually, it's like getting a hamburger bun with tomato, mayonnaise, lettuce, and even one of those little scrawny pickles, but no meat. Now, let's hear the Sugar Plum Fairy without the ground rhythm.
Now that sounds like a hamburger with no bun, ketchup, mayonnaise, or tomato, and definitely not that little scrawny pickle we talked about. <laughs> now just as you have to be still and listen for your heartbeat, so too with the ground rhythms. These rhythms can give music its vitality. The ground rhythms establish the meter, and they change the way you feel it. For example, let's listen to the effect of these two different ground rhythms back to back. Let's hear the entire Sugar Plum Fairy, and I want you all to notice how changes in the ground rhythm affect the music. When we think of rhythm, what is the first instrument that comes to mind? Drums. That's right, the drum. Mainly because drums generally play only rhythms and not melodies. In the orchestra, drums are included in the percussion section. And unless we are playing some type of military music, the drums, cymbals, and percussion are not used to carry a beat, but only for coloration or some type of flavor. The drums of the jazz band are actually a set of drums of various sizes and different types of cymbals. It is the centerpiece of what we call the rhythm section, which includes the piano and the bass. Now these three push, pull, and tug and move the band along like the engine, wheels, and body of a train. The drums of the jazz band function like the engine of the train. The drum set is used to power the band and can be used to interpret whole ground rhythms by itself.
In the orchestra, the cymbals are used for coloration or sometimes to strike fear in the collective hearts of the enemy. In the jazz band, the cymbals can be used for coloration, but most of the time they are played. Now, if you remember, we equated rhythms with motions like flying, hopping, jumping, skipping, and all of this. Well, the drummer of the jazz band rides the cymbal. And only now and then will he crash it. The bass and drums form a team, like the way the wheels of a train work with the engine to make the train move. Most of the time, what the bass does is called walking the bass. Now, when the drummer rides the cymbal and the bass player walks the bass, this is called swinging. And that is what the jazz band does. It swings. Also, swing is the basic rhythm of jazz music. Now, we add the piano. He is like the body of the train. The body gives the train its shape. And the piano accompanies, or we call it comping. He comps. He can improvise rhythms that fit on top of the drums and bass, something like blowing the train whistle. Or he can play rhythms that fit inside the bass and drums. It's something like giving power to the engine and propelling the train with added fire. makes the train look good and the piano makes the rhythm section feel good. Now let's listen to how the rhythm section propels the band in Duke Ellington's Vodka Voodie. Uh, 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 uh.
up to this point, we've talked about technical aspects of rhythm. But we haven't touched on the thing that musicians should always concentrate on, how to play rhythms with intensity and soul. Yes, with soul. It's like hustling in athletic competition. Rhythm has to be played crisply and with exuberance, even if the music is slow or if it's sorrowful music. Now we're going to hear both versions of Dance of the Reed Pipes. First Tchaikovsky's, then Ellington. And we're going to give our musicians a chance to show off.
finally, we will examine one of the best ways to play with rhythm. It is called syncopation. Now, the loosest definition of syncopation would be doing the unexpected. For example, let's say if you turn your cap a little bit to the side. See, now it's a syncopated cap. <laughs> syncopation can change the feeling of a musical phrase, just like syncopating the words in a sentence, like, he catches the ball, he's at the 5, the 10, 15, 20, 25, 30, 35, 40, 45, 50, 50, oh, he's running for the touch. He falls and breaks his nose. That's a syncopation. You didn't expect that. Or, since we're talking about footballs, we'll get one. Ooh, that's a good pass. Now, another example of a syncopation would be psych. That's a syncopation. Or else, syncopation. Syncopations are used to create rhythmic contrast and keep our attention, keep us on our toes. You see, you had to be ready for that one. It caught you by surprise. Now, how do we syncopate in music? By purposely going against an established rhythmic pattern. Let's remember that the accentuation of beats and rest form meter. If everyone is marching, hup, two, three, four, hup, two, three, four, and you come out there and march, hup, two, three, hup, two, three, hup, two, three. That would be a syncopation. You're accenting a beat that no one else is accenting. It's unexpected. We're going to see how Tchaikovsky syncopates the ground rhythm in this passage from Dance of the Sugar Plum Fairy. First, the accent is on this part of the beat. One, two, and one, two, and one, two, and, which is kind of a syncopation. Then it repeats irregularly, so it's what we would call twice syncopated. As a matter of fact, the Duke Ellington arrangement of this suite is itself a syncopation of the original. It constantly does the unexpected, that is, if you know the original. For example, let's hear an excerpt from Tchaikovsky's Overture. Now let's count the meter of this. One, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. You see the accents are on one and three. Now, let's hear Dukes. Now, which beats are accented? Did you all know which beats were accented? Two and four, that's right. It's known as the back beat. One, two, three, four, or one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. Also, the rhythm of the melody is syncopated. That's another syncopation. Now, what about this section from the march? And now, the Duke syncopation of the original. Uh, 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 uh. There are many ways to syncopate rhythms. But syncopation will almost always catch us by surprise and leave us smiling. Now, here are some of the things we've discussed about rhythm tonight. I want you all to keep this in mind when you're listening to these two overtures that we're about to play. One, we identify songs by their melody, but without rhythm, there can be no melody. Two, accented beats and rest fall into odd or even meters. Three, meters are divided into measures which are a point of reference for dancing, hopping, skipping, flying, tickling, so on and so forth, the rhythm. Four, tempo means fast, slow, kind of fast, kind of slow, and so on. Five, we play with rhythm by varying accents and rest. 
just like dribbling the basketball. Six, the ground rhythms are overworked and underappreciated, but they're essential to give music a vitality and a lift. Seven, the bass, drums, and piano are the rhythm section, and they swing. Eight, rhythms must be played with intensity and soul at all times. And nine, syncopation is accenting the unexpected. No motion, no rhythm. No rhythm, no music. So now see if you can remember some of these things while you hear Tchaikovsky and Ellington's overtures to the Nutcracker. And if you don't remember any of them, you can still check out this swing in music and enjoy it. Thank you. Two, 